It's only when you write extensively in one area you become inquisitive in another. In my latest book, The Promise Maker, I set the central protagonist Frankie, born in New York in the Lower East Side in 1930, moves to Dublin in 1935 where he encounters people and characters like Paddy Smith, Buster, Mary Applejaws, Codswallop, Harry Boy and Slasher, and in the Dublin in which he grew up in, the tenement world. However, the mind becomes inquisitive as he said. You begin to research in your mind of maybe what was it like for the people in this country, down as far as Wicklow, areas like that. What was it like for the people in the 1800s? As an investigating journalist, director, a writer, an artist, I became very inquisitive as to what were the people that probably came about the formation of a city in which I lived in, the people that emigrated from their own counties into Dublin in the 1800s. This is where the story begins in Wicklow, 1840. In 1838, the Poor Law Unions were established under the Poor Law Act due to widespread poverty. The Board of Guardians, the governing body, managed the workhouse and the Poor Law Unions. The role of the Board of Guardians was gradually increased to include public health, hygiene and rural housing. In 1898, Wicklow County took over most of the public health functions. This act had a large impact on the administration of the country. The former policies that were governed by the Grand Jury and the Board of Guardians, the medals held largely by landlords and the creation of the county councils, guaranteed a more vigorous application of administration with local people's influence and decision making. The county councils were an essential tool in establishing a democratic local government in Ireland and for the first time and in trying to improve social conditions for the people of this country. Wicklow, located south of County Dublin, is known as the Garden of Ireland. Ireland's beautiful garden. Wicklow has some of Ireland's most picturesque landscapes and sceneries, from mountains to the sea and its variation of beautiful gardens Powers Court being voted the third best garden in the world by National Geographics. The landscape of outstanding natural beauty is nothing but breathtaking. However, in the 1800s, there was an altogether different picture painted due to the impoverishment that would fall on its people. And one was in a place called Shalala. But for now we're not going to look at the place itself, we're going to look at what the name also was synonymous for, the stick in which the Irish used for fighting. The legend of the violent Irish, immortalised through traditional cultural images made infamous by British rulers, hinged on the shillelagh, a weapon that is old as Ireland itself, a weapon that the Irish brought with them to every country they found themselves. The battle sounds made infamous by the immigrants who were branded the fighting Irish. Ireland, the centre of Christianity in early pagan Europe. In the Annals of Ulster, historic text that covers the country of Ireland from St. Patrick's arrival in the 5th century to the 16th century states it this way. The people who occupied Ireland, known as the Celts, 
managed an agricultural lifestyle were constantly interfered with by both local skirmishes and international warfare. In the 9th century, the Vikings began to invade us, intermingling until they were defeated and essentially driven out by Brian Boru, the famed Irish king, in 1014. Irish independence would be brief. In the 12th century, the Normans invaded Ireland, which began the English rule. Henry VIII named himself King of Ireland in 1541. And under the reign of his daughter, Elizabeth I, the country was ripped apart through penal laws which persecuted Catholics. As the rulers changed, they reduced Ireland on a grand political scale. However, the Irishman inserted himself, not in the politics of the day, but in the skill of fighting, and the weapon of choice, the shillelagh. In Scorsese's film, The Gangs of New York, we'll see very clearly how the shillelagh was carried not only from Wicklow, but across the country into the Five Points of New York, where it becomes not only a weapon of choice, but a weapon of brutality at a ferocious level. In Martin Scorsese's film, The Gangs of New York, which is loosely based on the book by the same title, published in 1927, which shows the rise and fall of the New York gangsters of the 19th century, all of Irish immigrants, you had gangs, the Pug Uglies, the Dead Rabbits, the Forty Thieves, to name but a few. In the book, The Promise Maker, Frankie states it this way. Ma was Irish American of native, of this home away from home, Irish city full of every nationality under the sun. Her grandfather sailed, he had landing on a coven ship. He came to the part with the streets paved in gold. He didn't find gold. What he discovered was human and animal excrement. Up to his ankles, he slid in the looking for shelter among the tenements in the five points, close to the old brewery. Charles Dickens, in 1842, when visiting the neighbourhood, stated that it was a neighbourhood that was a close to explosion, spurred on by the immigrants from the Irish potato famine. They came to live in places that was miserable lodgings. He stated that it was a way of right to left, of reeking ways of everywhere, of dirt and filth, where such lives lived, bear the same fruit elsewhere. Their coarse and bloated faces at the doorways have their counterparts at home. Obviously making direct reference to the similarities of what was going on in New York and also going on in Ireland at the time, of its impoverishment. In the film, we see monks, played by Brendan Gleeson, carry the shillelagh with him which obviously shows us that the Irish didn't only carry themselves across the Atlantic, as Frankie states in the book The Promise Maker, but they brought their weapons of choice, the monks carrying his as a trophy. For he marked upon it every single blow and every single life that fell under its crushing power, only to fall under it himself where he would see his own demise, when Bill the Butcher, played by Daniel Day-Lewis, would ultimately snatch it from his hand and crush it across his own head in a violent display of anger of the Irish in New York in the Five Points, a gang-ridden neighbourhood where they would rule for over a hundred years. For was it not stated by the historians that it was a place of good-time ladies would swing from rafters and oversized cages, mob ruled the streets, murder lurked in the open squares, in the infamous slum where they would rule for a hundred years, overcrowding, centred on the intersection of Cross Street, Anthony Street and Orange, in cramped tenements, the outhouses were too few and often overflowing, sewage and pigs and animals ran in the street, the whole neighbourhood just stank, was reported by historians. But yet it was the chilele that would become the weapon of the Irish, not only in Ireland itself, but in New York, but back home in Wicklow, in chilele something else was rising, not in the form of a stick, but in the form of the workhouse in 1842. The workhouse was designed in a particular way that it would be very uncomfortable for people to stay there. There were three workhouses in Wicklow. The new Shillelagh workhouse was erected in 1840-41 on a six acre site, half mile to the southwest of Shillelagh, designed by the Poor Law Commissioners, architect George Wilson. The building was based on one of the standard designs to accommodate 400 inmates. Its construction cost 5,300 plus 1,000 for fittings, etc. The workhouse was declared fit 
for reception for paupers on the 21st of December 1841 and received its first admission on 18th of February 1842. Not only were the buildings formidable, horrible places, but also they created an atmosphere that people would come in and leave as quickly as they could. Because they didn't want them to be dependent on the state. The more I think over the unhappy condition of the people of this country, the more convinced I am that all their misery springs from the want of education, moral and intellectual. They get neither, either in their homes or generally in their schools, and I should say the higher ranks are very nearly as much in need of it in every point as the lower. The 27th July 1841 Charlotte Elizabeth Tonner was born on the 1st of October 1790. She was the daughter of Reverend Michael Brown, rector of Giles's church and minor canon of Norwich Cathedral, who contributed greatly to the development of Tonner's strong faith and devotion to God, the consequence of being raised in a Tory Royalist Church of England family. She was a popular Victorian English writer and novelist who wrote under the name Charlotte Elizabeth. She was noted for being a woman of strong mind and powerful feelings. Her works focused on promoting women's rights, as seen in her books, The Wrongs of Women, and also in her book, Protection, or in The Cradle and the Dog, in which the following characteristics quoted appears. Our greatest blessings come to us by prayer and the studying of God's word. Harriet Beecher Stowe wrote of her memoir, Personal Recollections, 1841, we know of no piece of autobiography in the English language which can be compared with this in rich of feelings and the description and power of exciting interest. Both women worked extensively with the poor in this country. Elizabeth Smith, she worked among those in Wicklow from the estate in which she lived. The reflective viewpoint is noted in her journal enables the reader to learn about the life and personality of the woman and also of her family and all her daily activities. And what she set forth is her goals, achievements and her concerns including politics, foreign affairs, religion, and the role of the women in which the world she lived in. Elizabeth Charlotte was different than that she worked extensively with those in Dublin, and her sole reason and purpose was motivated by her simple belief in God. She was also found to be working with the Irish in the slums of London. Wicklow's closeness to Dublin influenced the country's formation to a large degree of the time. The soaring rate of inter-county migration between Wicklow and Dublin could not be found anywhere else in the nation. By 1841, one of seven moved to Dublin. The Census Commission recorded that women were among the greatest number migrating to the capital. It was so large that it distorted the balance among the sexes of those remaining in Wicklow. And as they set forth on their journey with a hope of a new life, the question is, what awaited them as they arrived in the city that was branded the city with the worst slums in Europe? <laughs> 